Okay, so you may have heard me say this before. Asana without philosophy is just another form of exercise. Asana without the philosophy to truly support it and guide it and shape it and inform why we're doing what we're doing is really just a form of movement and exercise, and it can be beautiful. You know, what little time I spend on Instagram, I'm usually, there's usually someone doing something beautiful with their body, and it's quite beautiful, um, but it doesn't tell me very much about yoga. Okay, so it's movement, it's exquisite, it can be very difficult, it can be very simple, it's done mindfully, but again, if it's not attached to philosophy, what is it? It's just movement. So now if I've wed, and most of you in this room have some orientation to the philosophy of yoga, which itself is kind of a never-ending encyclopedia, you know, um, so much to know and to learn, but there are also some parameters by which we can really find meaningful understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. But now if we marry philosophy to the movement, we now have the beginnings of purposeful practice, right? Now there's practice for a purpose. But then the question is, what's the purpose? Because, and I spent a lot of time in the early years of Pari Yoga really trying to tie together these ideas of Ayurveda and uh, the energy body and the koshas and all sorts of stuff. We really systemized it. We created a really dense, rich curriculum so that depending upon your outcome, whatever your purpose is, you can really shape a practice. You know? And you can do it in a meaningful way that touches on our physiology, our emotions, our prana, our energy body, and we can do it with great purpose. But now really coming together for the first time in a few years, and maybe this is the first time I'm standing in front of you, I would ask you to consider what's the purpose? What's really the purpose? The less time you have left on the planet, the less time you have to waste. So, it's really becomes more and more meaningful to know what the purpose is. I would offer that we consider that the purpose is freedom. Freedom. And in a minute I'm going to define freedom, but what I would like to just suggest is it's more than just ameliorating our tension. It's not just a stopgap to not go insane. Yoga should be more than that. It shouldn't just be a temporal change or temporal alleviating of the symptoms that we all live within this, these vicissitudes, these constant changes called life. But really to live fully and yet to be free. And freedom is um, both an idea that I come to in the length of my, you know, over the duration of my practice, my life, but I would also offer it's not that original. Because the final, the, the, the end game, as it's pronounced really explicitly expressed in the yoga tradition, is Kaivalya. Kaivalya is the name of the last chapter, there's four, in the Yoga Sutras. Kaivalya. It's not a word we use a lot in yoga. What does Kaivalya mean? Kaivalya means literally, it means freedom, but the literal meaning of it is aloneness aloneness. And what that means is that you stand totally, 100%, completely, with yourself. And you don't bring any coloring with you. You don't bring any friends, family, planets, uh, society. You experience yourself as you are in your totality, alone. So that's the way Patanjali describes the outcome of practice. And what does that mean in real terms? Again, I go back to the idea of freedom. 
freedom. Now, in many ways, I think that there's been a false message in yoga, which is not a false, but just a misunderstanding, or perhaps it's just a convenient misunderstanding. It's very often confused as bliss. Or another form of confusion is transcendence. That if I can just transcend my stuff, then I've achieved the outcome of what potential of yoga is all about. It's all good. I mean, bliss is not bad. Bliss is pretty good. But unfortunately, bliss has an opposition. Bliss, there's a polarity to bliss. You probably know it. We probably all know it. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's called misery, right? It's not so complicated. The opposite of bliss is misery. And so bliss, actually, even to the extent that we can experience bliss, and I can, I'll make the case you can experience bliss. It's not that complicated, really. Just because by virtue of the fact of who we are at a, at the, at a relatively super le- superficial level of the soul, you are bliss. It's, bliss is you. It's not the world. It's not the lollipop or the new car or the lover or the this or the that. It's you. You're experiencing yourself when you experience bliss. That's a whole nother lesson, but we're going beyond that. This is like graduate course in yoga this weekend, and yet it isn't. And so the point is that that hunger for bliss actually creates a greater susceptibility to deep disappointment. So that's not what the yogis are looking for. We're looking for something else. The search to stand alone, knowing you in your most essential state is what it is that allows us to have freedom. And as opposed to transcendence, it's the opposite. It's a vastness of inclusivity, of being able to be unchanged even as your world falls apart. That's not transcendence. It's actually total acceptance. That as your world falls apart, as you encounter loss and death and heartache and disappointment and betrayal and confusion and the inner interface with the, what would otherwise be sources of stress, that feeling of integrity, that feeling of being with yourself is never completely overshadowed. That's the basis of freedom. Bliss is not bad along the way, but it's temporary, as we all have learned. It doesn't take very long to learn that. My, I have my youngest children are 14, almost 15, and um, it's clear. They're, they're very aware that bliss is temporary. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You learn it pretty early. You learn it pretty early. So... What this practice is, is about freedom. So now I need to go back, because the beginning of the discussion was, what are we here for? It's great to create purposeful practice. Beautiful. And those of you who could teach purposeful practice, and I know there's quite a few of you in this space that have studied so much, have a real high level of skill and understanding about the physical body and its needs, the energy body, its needs, the doshics, the doshas, and what changing the doshas does through yoga and through diet and all that. Beautiful. But now what's the purpose? And I would argue the purpose is freedom. That's what we're ultimately after. Now, we need self-regulation. We need to tend to our nervous system. We can't ignore our doshas. It's part of this field of inclusivity. There's no bypassing not if we wish to make the most use of this methodology. So freedom. So the point is now, how do I get free? So now we have movement, great, with purpose, but without self-inquiry, there's no freedom. Without self-inquiry, there's no freedom. 
So now you have movement, you have skill to, to know where you're going, you have the philosophy, you have the body of knowledge that tells you how to best use your asanas. But without self-inquiry, there's no freedom. And self, if you've been around before, you know, we promoted this idea, self is both. Study the big S, the soul, the self, interface with that, encounter what we is in the scriptures described as the fire of self-knowledge. To know that part of you that is unchanging, that endures uh, from the Gita, that stands on the sands of eternity, that even as the waves come in and out, that is the flowing nature of our lives and this whole thing of nature and society and relationships and division and conflict and all that, those are the waves that wash on the shore of eternity and you stand firm. That is the nature of the soul. And also studying the small s. How each of those little waves laps up at your feet, throws you into a tizzy. Throws each of us into a tizzy. Why am I in a tizzy? Based on that little wave, and then that little wave, and then that little wave, and that wave. And some are good, and some are not so good, and some are desirable, and some are not so desirable. And each one sends ripples through my consciousness that then I can't sleep at night. I'm so angry at that person. I'm so in love with that person. And those people are my people, and that, those people are not my people. Each of those waves come up and reaffirm our very firm beliefs of what we are and what we're not and who we like and who we don't like and what we care for and what we don't care for. I've studied over the last year and a half and learned more about the neurology of tribalism than I've ever known. And unfortunately, we're really hardwired into this tribalistic notions. It's hardwired. Literally to the point that your senses are impacted by it. It's not just your intellect and your emotions. If you went to the University of Michigan, wait, I'm in Illinois. So if you went to Northwestern, <laughs> if, you're in, if you went to Northwestern versus, who's, there, who's your arch rival in Northwestern? Who's football? Who plays? Is it Iowa or? Iowa. Iowa, okay, does that work? I mean, right, Big Ten, I know that much. It's Big Ten, can I go Iowa? Okay. So they literally did an experiment with taking a sweatshirt that one of these athletes would wear, then stuffing it into a plastic bag for two weeks, unra oh, and then doing it with a Northwestern, we'll say it's Northwestern, it was actually different. I think it was Ohio State and Michigan. That's why I said Michigan. And if you went to Michigan and you opened the bag and the sweatshirt had Michigan on it, you didn't smell anything stinky. <laughs> this is true. This is true. This is how hardwired these preferences and identities are. Versus if it was the opposite, if it was Iowa, for example, oh my God, this thing smells like a sewer. Imagine that. I was stunned by that. The research shows that you identify and you, things smell good or bad or indifferent just based on your identity. That's how hardwired we are. It's crazy. So those are the little laps of the thing that sends us into our discomfort or comfort. That's not freedom. No matter how long you can stand on your head, no matter how long you can hold your breath, that's not freedom. It's aloneness, is to stand, never is to really rest in that sense of yourself. So the answer is, how do you become more free? The, 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 the dissolution of duality. It's not as complicated as it sounds, and it's not as esoteric as it sounds, but as long as we have, as long as we are in du dualism, 
will naturally find division, and there will always be around the corner the next wave of suffering. So we've got to figure out how to end duality, and that's why we're here this weekend. Because the end of duality is in your heart. In your own heart is the end of duality. This is where the teachings describe that there is the merging of our individual self and the higher self, or divinity. Because again and again and again, the teachings say that the higher self and divinity are the same thing. The individual self gets, again, a little bit of confusion around individual self. Think about something. How many, how many, I'm just curious. How many of you like scary movies? Can you raise your hand? Don't be embarrassed. It's, it's great. Okay, cool. That's, most yoga crowds, you're definitely in the minority. But did you choose to like scary movies? Or did the essence that likes scary movies choose you? You actually came in with a proclivity to like scary movies. I know this story because I had twin boys. My first, ch- my first kids were twin boys. One loved to be scared. One hated to be scared. They were in the same womb, same food, born 10 minutes apart. The phases of the s- astrology didn't change in that little threshold there. And one hated to be scared. One loved to be scared. I would argue that their souls came in with that proclivity. And those proclivities then become your tendencies. And those tendencies then will lean you left or lean you right, will lean you red, will lean you blue. You think you chose those things because you're so smart. Because I just, I know, I've done my research. The blue's good, the red is bad, the red is good, the blue is bad. I've done my research. I know, I've learned. This isn't a learned opinion. I've been to Northwestern. And as a result of all of my knowledge, this is what I choose to be good. You came in with it. So your dualism comes from your soul, from your jiva. Your causal body is part of you. Now, where that ends, according to the scriptures, is where your individual soul meets your higher soul, which has no preferences, which is eternally free. And when those two things meet, duality ends. And then some other interesting things start to happen. Number one is they say that the mantras now become mastered. Some other things happen. You become spontaneous. You become, you you start to attract true friendship. Some other really wonderful elements, the cities of the heart, 14 of them, some artistic expression will start to manifest in you. Some really extraordinary things that aren't just so way out there. You begin to understand the true meaning of words, written words and spoken words. So when someone is speaking to you, you're actually seeing what the deeper truth that's behind their words. When you read, you actually see the deeper meaning that's between the lines. So our job then is to access our heart No big deal, provided you're willing to go with self-inquiry. Self-inquiry. That's what clears the way. Okay, so as as advertised, I described that um, I described that uh, we would be working with some key contemplations in the Yoga Sutras. We'll do asana, we'll do meditation, we'll do pranayama to support the work. And in essence, what the teachings are going to tell us is that the light of the heart, this merging of self and capital S and small s, that is made possible whenever the darkness, the shadow that overwhelms the heart is removed. That's basically what they tell us. And they say that there are four things that we need to really pay attention to in order to resolve them. Number one, our animosity. And I get it. I get it. There's a place for anger. 
There's justifiable anger. At times, anger is actually helpful. It's motivational. It's activating. I get it. But in terms of this, in terms of getting to freedom, you can't take animosity with you. Animosity and the path toward freedom are incompatible. I'm not saying the small s in you has these proclivities and there's things that piss you off. And I'm saying that's okay, but we just don't want it to overshadow. Does that make sense? Because it darkens the heart. And this whole idea that we can actually see where the self and the self meet uh, while we have the darkness of anger and animosity, teachings say no way, it won't happen. It's one or the other. So the second thing is compassion, or its counter is that cruelty. And it's interesting, cruelty at some level is, we think of this as a very overt act, something cruel. And there's some confusion in the yoga tradition because we came up, number one, number one, number one, ahimsa, ahimsa, ahimsa. You guys know that word. Himsa means violence, ah means nonviolence or without violence, and it just sounds like, well, if I'm not hitting you over the head, you and I are cool. <laughs> that's, not, that's an improper rendering of the whole deal. It's not the, it's not the withholding of violence that is inherently compassionate. Compassionate is an active, engaged expression of love and, 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 and empathy and feeling. So it's not just about not actively harming you. It's actually, if I'm withholding love, I'm actually practicing a form of cruelty. And here's the news. If you just don't feel very loving these days, it's okay. Then just get your mind quiet. Because the tradition is very clear. As your mind it becomes more quiet, you become more wise. The light of wisdom starts to become brighter. And as the light of wisdom comes, becomes brighter, it is inextricably woven to love. As you become more aware of the light of wisdom within you, you spontaneously become more loving. They are inextricably linked. So we have to get our mind quiet and become more aware of what's there when my mind is quiet, and automatically love will come with it. And the more loving you are, the wiser you are. This is why Buddha said that the essence of the mind was inherently um, pragna and karuna, love and compassion, love and wisdom. Okay, so second thing, we have animosity. Second thing, uh, initially animosity, uh, or, or, and then we, we develop, uh, uh, we remove cruelty from the mind. Third thing is uh, judgment, and last thing, jealousy. And it's okay, these are all very human characteristics, and as long as you understand, they kind of rise out of, they're neurological to some degree, they're emotional to some degree, but they're all informed by the jiva. Because who we hold animosity to is really, if you go back far enough, if you trace it deeply enough, it's in the soul. It's, you came in with the proclivity to be angry at those kinds of people, at those kinds of wrongs. And so all of this is the path of self-inquiry to resolve these four stains or shadows or clouds on the heart. And through that healing, the light of the heart becomes brighter and duality slowly diminishes. Our yoga now becomes laced not just with purposeful philosophy and wisdom, knowledge, but also we bring with it the path of self-inquiry. And with self-inquiry, we begin to see those patterns and we begin to make contact with our own heart, which then allows us to gradually be more free. That's, that's the path, at least in this trip to Chicago. <laughs>